to UNLV's new Cannabis Policy Institute. The first of its kind in Nevada, officials believe the institute will have a nationwide impact. Among them is Rihanna Durrett, director of the UNLV Cannabis Policy Institute. She's also the vice chair of the Nevada Cannabis Compliance Board. Rihanna, thank you for joining Nevada Week. Thank you for having me. So first off, why is UNLV a good home for this institute? Many reasons. A few of them include UNLV is an R1 classified research institute according to Carnegie classification. So we already have the infrastructure there to conduct research, disseminate research, um, so it's, uh, it's a good home for it. That cannabis policy, cannabis research is, um, it, there hasn't been as much around it as people would like. While the industry grows rapidly and rules change rapidly, UNLV can, can, uh, can be a place to keep up with those changes. And then um, finally, I would say we're, we're unique in that we, um, you know, we have, we have um, tourism in Southern Nevada that no other state has. We have uh, unique qualities, but also finally UNLV has um, tested these concepts before of policy institutes and we've done well the International Gaming Institute, the Center for Business and Economic Research, Brookings Mountain West. We're really good at developing these institutes. And I would imagine Nevada being one of the first states to get into marijuana uh, helps as well, or does it? Exactly, I think we were one of the first, uh, in that first group of states to legalize adult use. And uh, many states did look at, at our regulations as, uh, as a model for theirs. Uh, just for example, we are testing regulations are looked at through various states and we have some of the strictest in the country so we can help provide um, guidance. In your experience in this industry, you have several years of experience in marijuana law and policy, what is the most important public policy research needed in the cannabis industry right now? Uh, there's a long list, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll start with just a few. One of the hot topics today is rescheduling. Uh, President Biden has advised his administration to look into rescheduling, meaning taking it from a Schedule 1 prohibition, which is alongside heroin, um, to a lower schedule with perhaps less penalties, less pro prohibitions. The Department of Health and Human Services has recommended rescheduling to Schedule 3. The main changes of that would be perhaps more avenues for research and lower the tax penalties that these businesses face. Those are some of the primary um, penalties, but there's lots of questions around it because um, this, this, what all impacts will this have? Um, so that's a, a hot topic of the day um, and one that we are already looking at, scheduling panel discussions, um, writing um, articles about. Um, that is one that a lot of people should be interested in, even if they have nothing to do with cannabis, even if they feel like, well, this doesn't um, impact us. It could in some way, for example, banking, health, um, universities, gaming, et cetera. How does it impact all of those areas? Another would be the financial struggles of the market, um, it, because I think it's widely believed that they are um, it's highly profitable. There's a green rush, a green, uh, they, some people I often hear that they're just printing money. So I think this misconception about um, this, the financial status of these companies is very interesting. And related to that is the illegal market um, and, and its prevalence and, and, and surprising strength of the illegal market. And then finally, just an, uh, another one we're very interested in is um, tourism, of course, because that's a natural fit for us. So with the financial struggles, what is the reality of the cannabis industry? How profitable is it? So a, um, a report was released in the last few months from Whitney Economics stating that the, about 25% of them are profitable, which I think that is widely unknown. Um, in addition to that, there's a book that um, I find very valuable. It's called Will Legal Weed Win or Will something like that, uh -huh. um, and uh, it's about whether the industry is even economically viable. The entire industry, is it economically viable? Because a lot of um, their costs are a lot higher than people expected. Challenges are a lot higher than people expected. A legal market, is, it has a stronghold more so than people expected, and there are uh, significant taxes at the state and local level, and they pay significant 
kind of tax penalties at the federal level. So um, it's it's not those margins aren't as large as people expected. Let's break that down a little bit because the rescheduling could impact the business struggles that they're facing. How so? If this was rescheduled from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, how would that benefit them financially? Yeah, so there are a lot of questions around rescheduling, but one of the things that could happen if it's moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 is that an IRS code that applies to Schedule 1 substances um, would no longer apply, and so they would no longer, they would, it would allow them to take business deductions. Right now, under Schedule 1, they can't take standard business deductions, which especially small business owners know that's a, where a lot of, uh, where your ability to make money comes in, those business deductions that increases your margins. So, um, so if it is moved to Schedule 3, that will ease up the pressure on them quite a bit. The illegal market still is that strong? Yes, uh, the Nevada has commissioned a report that will kind of help us get an idea of the how strong it is in Nevada because we don't have those numbers. Based on what we see, it appears ex very active. If you just go online, you can find illegal companies that appear very sophisticated, very successful. Um, their channels of distribution are, are, are sophisticated. A lot of people wouldn't even know that they were illegal. Um, I th it's widely believed in, that a lot of illegal product comes from California that has a very big illegal market. So uh, it's very likely that our illegal market numbers are gonna be very high. That's so wild to me. I would think now that it's legal in certain states for recreational use, you would want to go to an actual facility and be, you know, uh, above board with everything, but that's not happening. Right, right. Some people are going to, to, to support the, the legal, um, some people have made that switch. Certainly. Um, but, and, and, you know, the, the result of buying on the legal market is we lose out on that tax revenue and, and then you're consuming untested products that have been found to have heavy metals, pesticides, um, harmful products. But exactly this, this, is I think a surprise to a lot of people that um, people find their the legal market to be such a so attractive, but it's for a variety of reasons. One, I think a lot of people, a lot of tourists anyway, probably um, they don't know necessarily the difference um, because the legal market appears like a legitimate business in some ways. Um, really. Uh, and this is from people looking just online. Right, exactly, exactly. And they yeah. physically go to a location that appears to be? No, they have it delivered. Have it delivered. Right, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So these are some of the public policies you're going to be looking to explore and, and inform people about so that you can address them and, and make this industry profitable or more profitable. On that note, so I looked at some of the numbers from the Nevada Department of Taxation, and for taxable uh, sales, 2021, they surpassed a billion dollars in Nevada, but then the next fiscal year, only 965 million, and then the 2023 fiscal year, 848 million. What is behind this decline in sales, yeah. do you think? Yeah, whereas you definitely want to see those numbers going up if you're a business owner, and if if you have you know tax revenue coming in from this, you want to see your tax revenue going up. Um, it could be a variety of factors. I've heard a theory that when um, the businesses were shut down during COVID, people reverted back to the legal market. Uh, and another one could be that prices have um, compressed and they haven't gone back up. So you see less uh, the you know, sales amounts being lower, tax revenue being lower as a result. Uh, several states have seen quite a drop in tax revenue um, after time because like I said, sales being compressed. Um, so inflation has not impacted the cannabis industry. Oh gosh, you'd have to act, ask an economist okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a variety of theories um, and uh, it is like, a big concern right, for those that are you know, invested in it and for the, I, and I would imagine for the state that you know, makes projections on these numbers and expects to see them growing, not declining. Not declining, it's interesting. Uh, and this always seems to get brought up on the topic of education funding in Nevada. Where is the marijuana money? Why hasn't that taken care of the woes in education funding in Nevada? And your answer to that would be? 
Yeah, the the funding that was indicated that it would be sent to um, public education funding, it was sent to public education funding. There was an additional amount that was sent to the rainy day fund, but a statute has now reverted that back to public education. So all the funding is going to public education. Um, it, it's it's not an amount that um, that would vastly overhaul our current education budget. It's not. It's not. It's not something to sneeze at or, or you know, take for granted. But it's. It's not something that would completely change the face of public education. Some people looked as it's going to solve everything. But but yeah, when you look at so if it's a billion dollar industry in the state and you're taxing these companies, I think about between ten and fifteen percent. Um, that's going to be about $100 million a year in tax revenue for education, which this year's fiscal budget for education was $6 billion. So it's just a small part of it, you know? Right. Again, it, it's, I think it's helpful to the state, especially because given the fact that these sales are occurring, people in every state consume cannabis. Um, it's the number one intoxicant around the world. So as long as people are going to be making these purchases, let's regulate it. Let's collect the revenue on it. Let's collect as much of the revenue on these sales that are going to take place anyway as we can. But exactly, that amount will never be $6 billion. And for those who say, well, then tax those marijuana businesses more. Let's get more education funding. What would you say? I think they're taxed. They're 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 maxed out on their tax level. There's a um, um, there's a 10% tax at wholesale or 15%. Or um, there's another 10% um, at retail. Um, it, it's a significant amount of taxes that uh, most most businesses. Uh, couldn't survive if they paid that amount of uh, taxes. So we're, we're the rate is as high as it can, and we have to look at other ways to increase that revenue other than increasing the rate. Okay, another area that you'll be researching. Um, the social equity aspect of the cannabis industry. The state in the 2021 legislative session set aside a certain number of social equity applicant licenses for cannabis consumption lounges. Uh, the social equity applicant definition, the state broadly defined as, quote, an applicant that has been adversely affected by previous laws that criminalized activity relating to cannabis. This is in reference to the war on drugs, which disproportionately impacted people of color. And Aisha Goines, who is an expert in cannabis policy and particularly in this area, helped explain this on our show last year. Let's listen to her first. The war on drugs was really a war on people, right? And what it was was an initiator to lock up uh, people of color. I, you know, it, it gives me great disdain to even talk about it because I always feel like I'm trying to justify the importance of a body of people, right? Their importance of having to be in this industry or being given the option to be in this industry. But the reality of it is, is we should not be making millions of dollars and just completely wipe away what happened to a generation of people, generations of people, because it's been 30 something years. So. All right, so the question that the state faced was how do we make up for these past wrongs and these social equity applications were, were part of their answer, um, even offering them at a reduced rate, uh, a discount of 75%. How well do you think that addresses social equity in the cannabis industry? Uh, she is so great. I have her teach at my uh, cannabis law class every, uh, every semester. Um, I defer to her often on these issues. Um, I think the consumption lounges are unfortunately not the panacea. I think she would agree. Um, I, I think a lot, there has already been a, quite a bit of research in this area, a lot of data collected on what various states are doing, and Nevada certainly has room for improvement. One of the struggles is um, licensing may not be the answer because the licensing doesn't necessarily bring you the resources you need to make it successful. A lot of people who have, uh, who already have financial backing um, have not been successful. So if you are entering the market when you don't have the financial backing, it's, it's, a, it's a big struggle. Um, I, 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 I think there are some um, groups that will do well. They have, um, they're incredibly, smart, um, uh, they put so much work into it. So I think there's some that'll do well. Um, I, I look forward to, potentially, some sort of um, hybrid 
way to get into the industry but have support um, and not be responsible for all the overhead and the success of, an, of, of, these big, of a bigger company. So something like a joint venture agreement, a micro licensing, this all needs to be worked out. But I very much look forward to um, the people who will be at the table working out something like that. Last thing, because we're running out of time, when might we see a cannabis consumption lounge in a casino? The first one in Nevada, not on tribal land, is set to open later this year, but that's not in a casino. When might we see one in a casino? Yeah, if, there are opinions on either end of the spectrum. Some people believe that will happen soon and that some some gaming companies are just, uh, are just busting at the seams ready to do this. Uh, I lean towards the more conservative side of They've shut down those conversations. I don't think that's going to happen for a while. Um, but I do think today we need to start talking about, well, when will it happen and what will it look like? So we're very well prepared. And so we can be, as, as, as we have been in many ways, the jurisdiction that people look to to do it successfully. And that is because currently they cannot, gaming operators cannot Correct. be in this industry. Rihanna Durrett, thank you so much for coming on Nevada with